welcome back. Uh, we're going to get underway and uh, head you toward lunch. So uh, I, <coughs> that is an attempt to impress on the panelists and those of you who will have questions and comments later on to be as brief as possible, but as complete as possible. Uh, I'm Jim Hoagland from the aforesaid Washington Post. Um, and we have a panel today that is uh, well qualified to talk about whether the European social model in a time of globalization, in a time when competitiveness and the export model seem to dominate the world scene. Unfortunately, we are missing one of our panelists, uh, Mona Salen, who is a former Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden was not able to be with us today because of family reasons. Um, as an American, I regret this very much because she has quite a very interesting set of quotes on wiki quotes, which you can all go and look up. But one that uh, caught my eye that I wanted to talk to her about was the quote where Mona says, for me, tax is the finest example of what politics really is and that paying taxes is cool. Uh, you can imagine that in the uh, Congress of the United States, these words might be seen as heresy. Um, I want to get started with the conversation right away, and we'll ask, first of all, for comments from Joaquin Almunia, who is uh, the Vice President and the Commissioner for Competition at the European Commission. Joaquin. Thank you very much. Well, this question about the future of the European social model is not new, is not, uh, has not been uh, provoked by the crisis. This question was uh, in, uh, on the front uh, of uh, many debates before the crisis, even the, during the 19s and probably during the 80s. Uh, we have in Europe, in some of the uh, European uh, member states, mainly northern member states, the best examples of what a welfare state is, a social model is, what uh, the social policies can deliver to the citizens, how to protect and to ensure uh, social rights for citizens. And at the same time, we have in the European Union, in particular after the last enlargement in 2004-2007, we have uh, uh, member states, countries that uh, never knew what a social model is in European terms. So we have, on the one hand, the need to uh, strengthen the basis, the grounds of uh, the possibilities of building a social model or reinforcing the present uh, social models in, uh, in uh, Europe. This means growth, and we need badly, <laughs> badly need growth. This means uh, productivity and employment. This means flexibility to adapt the social services, the social policies to the new challenges and to the new features of our society that are not the same, are very different than the ones we knew in the past. We need to face uh, aging, we need to tackle the immigration, we need to uh, recognize the fact that the family structure has changed, we need to be fully aware about the new inequalities that are growing in our societies. But uh, the question, um, and this would be my second and last remark in this first intervention, many of these decisions should be adopted at the national level. The European uh, institutions, we don't have the possibility to uh, organize uh, the adequate uh, strategy for improvement, uh, improvements in the educational sector, in the health sector. Uh, this uh, belongs and will continue to belong to the national level of decisions, but at the same time, without a good uh, uh, functioning of our economic and monetary union, without a more efficient uh, strategy to ensure sustainable growth in Europe, our member states will not be able to do what they say they, they want to do. And uh, one of the uh, very difficult elements of this uh, discussion and is one of the links that needs to be improved between the national level and the EU level is the tax issue. A single member state in Europe within a single market in a global economy with free movement of capital 
is not sovereign to decide whatever they like in, in, the, in tax issues. And at the same time, at the EU level, the, every tax decision requires unanimity, so one single member state can block and can veto. So improvements in the way we can organize our tax systems in a way consistent with growth and at the same time able to fund the, the uh, welfare state, the social policies, and the social model. So we have a lot of challenges, but uh, the question, again, is not the new one. Joaquin, let me uh, refer again to the American experience and ask you the leading question on your last point. Where would the leadership come from for a tax reform, a tax revision on a European level? I think uh, the uh, European Council, the head of state and government, yesterday we had uh, here in the dinner the president of the European Council, uh, with the 28 head of state and government, and in particular within the 18 leaders of the Euro area, and uh, the European Parliament, they need to uh, discuss seriously what needs to be done in a single market, in an economic and monetary union, to get a more efficient tax system consistent with our uh, growth strategies and at the same time able to fund our needs from the expenditure side of our budgets because we need to uh, recognize that uh, since many years, and in particular this has been accelerated since 2008, 2000, uh, since the beginning of this crisis, the tax levels are not enough to uh, finance the expenditures and debt levels have increased, have accelerated in their increased trend since 2007, 2008, and in uh, some of our member states, this path is uh, really unsustainable. So we need to uh, the leverage, do we need to reduce the indebtedness level, but it's not politically, it's not socially possible to uh, cut in a very, very sharp way the expenditure side in, in the social policies that represent more than 50% of the total public expenditure in most of our member states. And this requires a very serious uh, discussion on what are the taxes that can be adopted without raising barriers in our internal market and in a consistent way with growth. It's not an easy debate, it is a, a, a very essential one. Let's pass this hot potato along to Eve. Yves Leterme, who is Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, former Belgian Prime Minister. Uh, Eve, as uh, a Christian Democrat leader in Europe, are you, do you sense an eagerness for a debate about tax policies? And secondly, I wonder if in your remarks you could reflect on what it means to be European in the social model sense. What is distinctive about that uh, and how uh, that can be maintained in the era of globalization. Thank you very much. Um, to put it a little bit provoca provocating, um, provocative, I think you can uh, turn, in fact, the central question of this part uh, of the debate the other way around. Personally, I think you could just ask um, how will emerging economies how will they build up a, um, a social security system, a comprehensive social security system to render their economic development sustainable? I think with our knowledge we have today, we can say that social cohesion, that investing in all talents, having all people on board, is I think a precondition to have sustainable development. And so to say, I think we, we approach the whole of the question in a very defensive way, I think you really can put it the other way around. And the main part of the problem seen from a global point of view in terms of the human beings uh, is, is, is more at the side of the emerging economies, which uh, are sometimes confronted with very huge uh, aging population problems, like China, for instance. And the question is how way they build up systems like we already have, once again, because to my opinion, a good social cohesion and a system that provides this is really a precondition for sustainable development, economic prosperity in, in the long run. Secondly, I think when we talk about European uh, welfare states, uh, we have to be well aware of the fact that there is not such a thing like the European social model. In fact, we have a coexistence of, of at least three to four different models. 
I won't elaborate on the characteristics. It is very clear that the Scandinavian model, uh, that the Rhineland model with Germany, Austria, Belgium, Luxembourg, and so on, and then France, and I would say the Anglo-Saxon model, the UK, and then the etc. model of some countries in the southern part of Europe, and then some central and eastern European countries that have built it up and completed it more and adapted more recently, this is quite different. Um, I think it's better, and I come to the third point, to put it in terms of what is the burden social cohesion and solidarity puts on the economy. And there on average, the uh, 34 OECD countries, which are globally spoken the most developed uh, industrialized <coughs> countries in the world, we see that 22% of GDP on average is dedicated to social policy, with some countries with a very low uh, part of their GDP, like uh, Chile, uh, some other countries, uh, which are still building up this uh, social welfare state. And at the top, we have countries like, let me give two very different examples, France and Sweden, which are countries that are performing in, in an economic, from an economic point of view very differently with uh, different success, with 30% of their GDP dedicated to, uh, to the social welfare state. So I think it's a better, a better um, figure to, to measure what kind of burden you put on the, on the economy. I would add that the distinction we make between a social comprehensive social security system, of which the initiatives come from the public authority, and on the other hand, in your country, for instance, the so-called private, privately organized, the private provision of social services, which, um, well, the results are not so uh, convincing always. Uh, I mean, the, this uh, antagonism between the two is, is a little bit uh, artificial because, for instance, in the European system, we tax social allowances and you give lots of tax deductions to encourage people, through computers or not, to, to sign in on, on, uh, on social security, health uh, um, insurance systems, and so on. Um, last but not least, I think we really need reforms, but some of the reforms have already been uh, put in place, partly, but it's of course longer careers, the aging of the population, when you add 15 to 20 years of life expectancy, well, you have to draw the consequences and you have to have longer careers. I think in terms of health insurance, you have uh, to have more selectivity, and in the whole of the social security, social security schemes, it's uh, very obvious that, especially in Europe, there's a need for more efficiency and more effectiveness. And I would add, and there I refer to the PISA result of, uh, the results of the, the PISA review, I think it was two or three weeks ago we presented them. I think especially Europe has to be aware of the fact that skills are the currency of the 21st century, at least, and maybe of the future more globally spoken. And so invest more in resilience than in security is really very important for Europe social resiliency and individual resiliency becomes more important as a concept than security and it means giving people the tools, investing of the tools, the capacities of the people when they are unemployed, when they have uh, problems to react themselves. There must be more uh, responsibility put in the, on, on the, the person themselves, the citizen themselves. Do you think that the economic crisis that Europe has just been through, seems to be recovering from now, has created the political will to bring about the reforms you suggested, or will we need further crisis, further developments? Well, first of all, like the Commissioner said, it's uh, in terms of competences. It's not a uh, competence of the European Union until now to act very actively in the field of social security. But I think to, to have been one of them, I think that all political leaders in Europe are well aware of the fact that in terms of competitiveness, things have to, have to, have to change. But also there, let's be realistic. You know, the, the highest tax wedge in the European Union for the moment is, I think it's the German. In, in Germany you have the, the most important tax wedge. And you see that nevertheless this economy is very well performing because in terms of uh, other uh, field domains, the way companies are organized, uh, innovation, the labor cost as a whole, they have uh, done a lot of efforts. But to answer your question, I think the European leaders know that there is a, that there is a, a very important task to render the European economy more competitive, but it is really a broader problem than only the problem of the labor cost. It's certainly a problem of the labor cost, and we have to have a shift from uh, financing our social security schemes, for instance, based on the, labor, on the cost of labor and taxing labor to other ways of, uh, of taxing and, and uh, having the money for, for these schemes, but it's only a part of the 
uh, the big problem of the competitiveness of the of the European Union that would lead us far more, much more uh, further than the five minutes but we can come back on this issue uh, yes. later. Yeah. we'll have a chance to uh, Jean Pisani Ferry uh, is known to many of you from his work uh, at Bruegel in Brussels uh, he is now as I gather it the eminence grise of the group of eminence grises that <laughs> the French uh, Quai d'Orsay has assembled uh, in the policy planning staff. Uh, Jean, you've heard two of our panelists say that, in fact, Europe doesn't function uh, at the European level. There is not a social model. Is that the problem? Uh, thank you. Let, let, let me first correct. I'm not, I'm not uh, don't belong to, to Quai d'Orsay. I'm uh, responsible for policy planning reporter to, reporting to the Prime Minister. Um, I, uh, y y yes, I think, um, you know, th it's not, it's not, th there is this perception of a, of a European social model. Uh, Mrs. Merkel famously said that uh, we represent 7% of world GDP and 25, 7% uh, of world population and 25% of world GDP, but 50% of, of uh, spending, uh, social spending, so there, there must be an issue there. Uh, and I think that's factually correct, obviously. Uh, that's, uh, that's striking, but that's a bit uh, misleading uh, for the reason you gave, actually. Uh, so I, I think we have a common set of, of preferences with very different institutions. The institution, national institutions are different. Uh, you have very different pension system. Uh, you have uh, labor markets institutions are different. So anything that you know, is about reform immediately goes to the national level. Uh, now, there are some, some common issues. I would, I would emphasize first what you said. Normally, you, you don't put education as, a, as a one of the pillars of the social model. I think we should. Uh, Europe started with universal education. That's how we built our prosperity. And we are under-investing in education. I mean, we are we bad in the ranking of the PISA ranking. The first European country is number eight. Uh, there are s seven Asian countries or cities uh, above. Uh, Sweden, uh, we consider Sweden, you know, one of the uh, jewels of uh, the European social model. It's dismal in terms of the PISA ranking. Uh, we are pretty me mediocre in, in France. I think we are, we are definitely under-investing, under-investing, and that having prosperity without having education, that's basically rent-seeking. And there are not many rents we can, we can draw on. There are still rents, that's why, why we, are, we are prosperous. But we, if we continue under investing in education, I mean, the prosperity is not going to, to, to stay because the rents are going to, to go. So, so really, uh, that's one of the pillars. And that's very much um, you know, coherent with the modern approach to, uh, to, to social policies. I'm referring to Amartya Sen and people who say it's really building capabilities. And building capability starts at school and even starts at the primary school. And that's where we are, we are failing. So I would, I would say that about, uh, about school. Now let me take another example on, on, on pension. I think, again, I agree with you. Uh, we shouldn't confuse aging and pensions. I mean, aging is, I mean, we, we're ahead in terms of aging. Uh, well, we're behind uh, Japan, but we're ahead of a number of other countries. But aging is a universal phenomenon. Uh, and it's good, and so we have a problem with our, our pension system, and, but it's not the fact that it's a public pension system, it's the fact that there, there's aging behind and there's uh, little growth. So what should we do? First of all, there's the issue of diversification. Basically, everything is invested in sort of a, a single asset, which is growth uh, of the national economy with the pay-as-you-go systems. Uh, so the, the, the problem is that this diversification should have started earlier, it hasn't started in some countries, so we are invested. Uh, the wealth of the, the income of the, uh, of the future uh, pensioner is invested in this single asset, which is the domestic economy. Uh, what can be done is to try to make the adjustment between pensions and the growth rate more automatic, and that's the spirit of the reform that was introduced in Sweden with the notional accounts, so that instead of having you know, to bet on a future growth rate and to tell people you're going to get that, the, that uh, provided growth is what we expect it to be, uh, it should be recognized that the, the, the ability to, to provide pension is linked to the performance of the economy. 
And so there should be more automatic uh, adjustment and that the system of uh, notional accounts that was uh, put in place in some countries. So that's the direction of, of, of reform, I think, for, for us. And now we turn to Didier Rindiers, uh, who's Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Affairs Minister of Belgium. Um, he represents the Mouvement Reformateur, which I believe is a liberal in the European sense yep. party. Uh, <laughs> so I would bring my tax question back to you, but also ask you to sketch, sketch for us what is the center-right version of the European social model? I don't know if it's uh, possible to have a center-right vision for the entire Europe, because we don't have all the same approach, maybe in the different member states. Because first of all, uh, the, the social issue, it's a national one. If you look to the situation now, the social security systems and all those uh, systems also in education are first of all at the national level. But it's possible to see some elements at the open level also. Uh, of course, we need to sustain growth. We had the capacity in the last year to resist again the financial crisis. And that's maybe the first way to sustain also a, a social model in the open level. But I'm sure that um, from my point of view and for many liberals in Europe, we had many discussions in the last years about that, uh, we need to do more at the open level. It will be maybe interesting to see the evolution in Germany now. After many years, it's possible due to a new coalition to discuss about um, a minimum wage. And I'm sure that if you look to the situation in Europe, we have a federal approach just for the monetary uh, policy right. with one currency for next month's 18 uh, member states and with only one central bank. But we are still with uh, the different member states acting for the budget and also for the tax policy and of course for the social policy. Is it possible to, to think about, as a liberal also, as two, three elements. First, to have some common approaches for minimum rules. Two examples. We have for the moment such a discussion in Germany about the minimum wage. Why not the same discussion at the open level? Maybe not with the same level, but a minimum. In Belgium, for the moment, we have a minimum wage of between 10 and maybe 11 euro for one hour of work. Uh, in Germany, they are discussing about 8.75, something like that. But we have for the moment people coming from the south of Europe or the eastern part of at work in Belgium in some fields with less than three euros for one hour. Is it possible to discuss at the upper level about the minimum? I don't know if it's possible to have a minimum like in Belgium from 10 or 11, but maybe to start, I don't know, with five, four or six, and then to increase and to have such a capacity to avoid a social dumping. And I'm sure that to do that, we need to organize the same kind of federal approach for the budgetary policy. We are trying to do that with the banking union, but maybe with some uh, reference in the tax systems and in the social uh, system. The same issue for the posting of workers. We have for the moment many, many competition about different uh, companies with workers coming from uh, different parts of Europe. I don't want to uh, avoid that, but maybe to have some minimum rules. And is it possible to do that with uh, all the member states. I'm not sure if the term was saying that there are different social models in Europe. And of course, I'm sure that it's needed maybe to start with the members of the Eurozone. That's the core of the European Union. Maybe also with those countries who want to be members later of the Eurozone. But if there are others who doesn't want, it's not a reason to don't uh, go further. And so I'm sure that uh, we need to have some minimum rules in the tax systems, also in the social uh, issues at the open level. And that's maybe the way to think in the near future, because just to say a last word, in my mind, uh, our model in comparison uh, with others in other parts of the world, I don't speak about China or, or Russia, but also about the US, uh, it's to say that we are fighting against poverty and nobody in Europe, and maybe in the northern part of Europe, if you have a job, you need to go out of the poverty. And now there is a debate, to give an example in Germany, is it possible to have a job and to stay in the poverty? Normally in all social security model, if you have a job, you are going out. And you receive, maybe if you don't have a job, a lot of uh, uh, help to don't go to the poverty. And that's the reason why I'm sure that we need to fix a lot of minimum rules in the entire Europe. Of course, to do that, 
There are other investments that will come back maybe on that later in education, it's true, and I've said that it's quite important, and maybe we need to agree with some mobility in Europe. And we have seen that, eh? if you look to the situation in Portugal, in Spain, in other countries for the moment, in Italy since the beginning of this year, it's a lot of people, maybe 200,000 people, going out of Italy to search a job in another part of Europe. So mobility is maybe also a part of the, of the issue, but at least with minimum rules. And so I don't hesitate to speak about a federal model. That doesn't mean uh, United States of Europe. It's not the, the US model for the social uh, issue, but some kind of minimum rules at the open level. That's uh, the real goal for the next years. I, I think that's a very useful clarification. I mean, I think there is at the European level a greater degree of social cohesion and concern about one's fellow citizens than there are in other parts of the world, including the United States. Uh, you used a phrase that I think might help us understand a little more that I would like to ask you to clarify. Social dumping, it's important to avoid social dumping. What do you mean? Well, like in the tax issues, it's the same. Uh, to give an example in taxation, because I was in charge for 12 years uh, for the finance department in Belgium, uh, we have tried to help before the crisis, uh, before 2008, during many years with the structural funds in Europe, we have tried to help some new member states or some member states to reach the average of development in Europe. And just an example, in Ireland, we have s spent a lot of money coming from the structural funds. But due to that, it was possible to have a corporate taxation in Ireland with 12.5% as a rate, in comparison with an average of maybe more than 25 in the rest of uh, Europe. Is it acceptable to spend a lot of money coming from the European level to help different regional countries, and then to see such a reaction? On social side, it's the same. The social dumping for the moment, it's uh, due to two facts. Or we have some uh, companies coming from one country in the European Union working in another one, but with not an application of uh, the national uh, um, social security system of the country where we are, they are working, but their own social security, to give an example, <laughs> not to speak all the time about the construction of building sector or transport on the ground, but in the aviation sector, we have some companies in the low cost coming in different parts of Europe and working there with their own social security model and not the social security model of the country where they are working. But it's the same now for the moment we are confronting in Belgium, in other countries, I spoke about the posting of workers. We have Belgium companies having now a subsidiary in Portugal or in Poland to apply in Belgium, no more the social model of Belgium, but the social model of Portugal, of or Poland, and in an economic crisis, of course, there is a stress on that. And is it possible to go further with that? I'm not sure. Without, I, sp I said, some minimum rules. Not to ask to the entire Europe to apply the same rules as in Belgium, but at least to have some minimum standards in the entire European Union. And if we, if it, we are not able to do that, we will have more and more reactions against the European model. Uh, and we will see that, but for the next elections, I don't want to uh, uh, be uh, uh, in a difficult way in the next weeks of having said that, but I'm afraid to have maybe one third of the next European Parliament with Eurosceptics mm. and with populists. Mm. So with many people against the European Union. If we don't can take care of that, also with some approach at the European level on social side, we will have more and more difficulty. So, to be concrete, I'm sure that we need now to politicize the European debate, not just to add in many countries people in favor of the European process and Eurosceptics. We need to speak about employment, labor market, labor policy, tax issues, social issues, with a real political debate from left side, from right side, from the liberal, the socialist, and others. But we need to have a real political debate on that. Eve, we need to politicize the European question? brief, uh, I won't stand in the next European elections, but I would like to underline the, uh, the, the, the truth of what uh, Didier is saying. I think it's really crucial for the Commission, for the European Council, to have a message for these people. I give you two examples, recent examples from my former constituency. I went to see a, um, a company that produced vegetables, <laughs> frozen form. 
Well, people there are replaced now by Romanian workers that are, so to say, employed in Romania, but that are doing the job for a, a lower salary. And in Zeebrugge, which is one of the main ports in, in Belgium, the container traffic, the uh, modal shift is organized with truckers that are, in fact, employed, so to say, by Romanian company and that are competing with, and, and in terms of salary, it puts uh, competing with uh, Flemish beer, Belgian uh, truck drivers. And, and for ordinary citizens in Europe, Europe is perceived, as Didier says, not only as you are in favor in Euro of Europe, of you are against Europe, it's, it's, a, it's an institution like all other political institutions, and it is worth being part of the debate when it delivers for its citizens. And for the moment, lots of ordinary people are um, perceiving Europe as a part of the problem instead of a part of the solution. I know it's very easy what, uh, what I do now to say this. It's more difficult to, to, uh, to uh, put solutions uh, forward, but I really would not underestimate this effect in the uh, outcome of the next uh, European elections. Uh. Yeah. Solutions are what Jean is supposed to give us. Uh, that's part of his job. Can you talk a little bit about these problems that have been uncovered, but also give us a sense for those of us in the rest of the world. I will now insert the journalistic so what question. Why should we care about the success or failure of the European social model? Well, let me give you one reason. Um, <laughs> as, as we said, I mean, there is a lot of uh, resistance now uh, in various countries about this uh, development that are perceived as being unfair. Uh, one uh, <coughs> particular reaction that didn't get so much noticed was David Cameron's change uh, of view on immigration. Uh, the UK, at the time of the first European enlargement, was the first country to say, welcome. Welcome to these workers from the uh, uh, Eastern European countries. Now they have completely changed course. And he says, uh, they're Romanians and they're Bulgarians because the other ones have a right <coughs> to come. They're not welcome. Uh, and that's a result of the reaction of public opinion in the UK. So if we see a situation where, for all these reasons, we're putting brakes more and more on mobility, on the integration of services markets, they were resisted <coughs> also at the time of the services directive, we may well end up in a situation where we have still one currency, but a very fragmented economy. And that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. We can't have a single currency we're at the same time putting barriers, putting borders uh, between those economies. One of the reasons we had the euro crisis was that we had a, a, a euro economy that was not integrated enough. And for that reason, we could have very uh, large divergence in inflation rates for a very long time. And that led to the crisis. So the, the answer to this, uh, this, this problem should be more integration. But this does not go without conditions that make it acceptable for the people. So I think Didier Renders is very uh, coherent. I mean, he's, uh, he's been uh, one of, the, uh, of, of, the, of, of those fighting for the survival of the euro, and he says also that we need, we need to, to, to enlarge the compact of social rights that are considered you know, common and, and necessary for those participating in integration. Joaquin, what do you think is the biggest single social problem that the European Union, and therefore the Commission, faces and what do you intend to do about it? Well, during these years, indeed, the, the problem number one is unemployment that is not evenly distributed uh, within the different uh, member states. You have uh, Germany and some other countries around uh, Germany that have even lower unemployment rates now than uh, the day before the crisis started, whereas Greece or my own country, Spain, uh, have 26% uh, of unemployment, more than 50% of youth unemployment, and the uh, lack of uh, possibilities to use the human resources they have that is one of the most important assets these uh, countries have. How to deal with these uh, unemployment uh, problems is, uh, requires uh, different uh, actions. Of course, we have some macroeconomic problems that are not being solved within the EU and in particular within the Economic and Monetary Union. The fact that, that the periphery of the Euro area is undergoing a very serious adjustment, not only fiscal adjustment, the current account uh, adjustment is impressive in uh, countries such as Greece or Portugal or Spain or others, whereas 
the surplus countries are not investing the excess uh, savings that they have, and this creates uh, problems from the demand side that are, are not helpful to uh, open possibilities for the countries that need to absorb unemployment and to, to create uh, opportunities for their people. And at the same time, we have another very important social <coughs> problem that apparently is a, a paradox, but uh, it's taking place at the same time in migration. Because part of uh, our countries in Europe uh, needs labor force from abroad, in some cases from other member states of the Union, with the political tensions and the social tensions that were discussed by, by Didier and Jean. And when we project our labor force evolution and the needs in the future, we realize that it's not only about uh, immigrants coming from other parts of Europe, but immigrants coming from abroad. But our societies are not prepared for this. And the race of uh, populism uh, and the race of uh, Eurosceptics, that is a real difficulty for the next uh, European elections in, in five months' time, is partly based on this uh, immigration tensions and this feeling that uh, those who come from abroad will hijack our public services, our social policies, and all this. And this requires a huge political effort. And no one can deal with these challenges in Europe in an individual basis. The European solutions are more efficient to tackle these big challenges, but at the same time, the defensive attitudes of the national uh, political leaders and the national political forces tends to embrace protectionist attitudes, uh, nationalistic uh, trends, uh, defensive uh, positions, and we are there in a, in a very difficult uh, situation where the solutions that are needed and that needs to be discussed and put in place gradually, but uh, without uh, waiting for any uh, other moment, we will not have good moments to, to discuss these issues, are there and at the same time the political trends are defensive, are protectionist, are nationalistic, and the very European uh, idea that uh, was very helpful for many reasons in Europe during the last uh, 15 years at this moment is in a very difficult situation. Is it possible to establish a relationship between immigration flows and competitiveness in the national case? Well, I think for a country to be competitive, uh, uh, a lot of things uh, needs to be done. Uh, a modern industrial policy, improving uh, financial flows, uh, uh, the adequate institutional framework. But of course, if you want to be competitive, you need to have a skilled labor force. And if you don't uh, have a national labor force, because aging and because the the lower fertility rates, you need to uh, uh, open the, the doors unless you will uh, decide to reduce your potential growth and to base only your possibilities to growth on productivity. But uh, nobody can imagine that all the countries at the same time can be the number one in productivity terms to be more competitive. Now we'll take questions from the audience. Right here in the front row. We could have a microphone. <coughs> I see they're on their way. Thank you very much. Uh, a very um, essential part of the European social model uh, was uh, the existence uh, and the success uh, of social dialogue, meaning that social partners uh, were in constant uh, contact and uh, allowing not only the development, but also reform of the European social model. And um, I'm missing in uh, this debate uh, uh, the question of what importance would this social dialogue should ha have in the future, particularly if it's necessary to, de to develop uh, various forms of the European social dialogue. Take one question over here. Well, I believe I was first. Um, yes. You don't see me. And I'm in I'll, take you, I'll take you next, sir. Actually, I was calling on the gentleman here. Oui. Bonjour. Je, je, je suis uh, ancien ministre algérien de la protection sociale. Et la particularité, c'est qu'en tant que chercheur, 
je m'étais investi euh, dans le, un travail sur la, le, la marginalité, sur les bidonvilles en périphérie euh, d'Alger. Et donc, euh, à l'époque, j'avais conçu un nou, une nouvelle approche de réduction de la pauvreté qui a été adoptée par un certain nombre d'institutions multi, multilatérales et adoptée par un certain nombre de pays. Évidemment, cela m'a donné une expérience et cela m'a donné la capacité de jeter un regard différent et de relever un certain nombre de préoccupations importantes dont je vais vous en faire part, surtout quand je regarde, parce que je suis assez souvent sollicité par mes amis européens pour amener un regard extérieur, d'autant que nous sommes aussi concernés par les anciens flux historiques d'immigration de population ou d'immigration récente. Alors, le sentiment, d'abord, je vais procéder pédagogiquement par une légère provocation. Le sentiment, c'est que des pays qui ont une, une belle capacité d'expertise, qui ont une ancienneté dans la gestion et la fluidité du service public, sont mis en échec de la même façon que des pays récents, sous-développés, qui ont des problèmes de gouvernance. Chez les uns, les, 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 les bidonvilles prolifèrent, et chez les autres, il y a de grosses difficultés à gestion de la banlieue. Et donc le sentiment, un peu, et la question ouverte, est-ce que le système social, en ce moment, dans les questionnements politiques, est-ce que la question du financement ne polarise-t-elle pas abusivement le débat, d'une part Deuxièmement, est-ce qu'une euh, grosse partie de la problématique euh, euh, n'échappe pas Et, et je, je, je m'explique. Est-ce que le système de sécurité sociale, qui pour l'essentiel est tourné autour de la prestation, qui est pour l'essentiel est autour du monde du travail, du chômage, de la perte de travail, du gain de travail, des ayants droit, est-ce que toute la partie liée aux nouvelles cartographies sociales européennes, aux nouvelles populations, la partie de l'exclusion, la partie de la marginalité, qui pose entre autres des questions de citoyenneté, qui pose entre autres des questions de communication, qui pose entre autres des questions de compatibilité en termes culturels. En fait, inventer les nouvelles sociétés, parce qu'il faudra que mes amis européens se rendent compte qu'ils ne sont plus les mêmes, ils sont différents. Alors, est-ce qu'ils doivent relever le défi du futur en disant comment ce présent qui va déjà m'annoncer le futur, comment dois-je le, le gérer et, 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 et en plus, vous, vous l'avez évoqué, c'est une partie de gisement de population nationale. Je parle des gens de nationalité européenne qui risquent d'échapper à mes efforts de développement, en recherche développement, j'ai besoin d'innovation, j'ai besoin d'audace. Et il n'est pas évident que ces populations dites marginalisées sont incapables de s'insérer dans l'inventivité, dans l'audace, etc., et donc, est-ce que ce grand questionnement ne doit-il pas insérer Est-ce que l'ancienne mécanique qui s'occupe que de la prestation, des remboursements de santé, de ceci, est-ce qu'elle n'est pas d'ores et déjà obsolète Est-ce qu'il ne faut pas revenir à une préoccupation fondamentale Comment le système social doit aussi avoir une dimension de responsabilité sur la cohésion, sur l'unité, sur la performance de la société, son futur et sa capacité d'innovation Merci. Merci. Uh, yeah. We'll take one more question over there before we begin answers. I'm Ernst von Weizsäcker. I used to be member of parliament. And at parliament, I was chairman of the, Envir uh, of the Environment Committee and before that of the Globalization Committee, in which we also looked at the history of the European social model, finding, not surprisingly, that it was a child of the Cold War. It was necessary for the West to prove that the free market economy was better for the masses, not only for the rich, than communism. This was the way of proving to Europeans and others that the free market economy can be good for all. This was actually coming from America. George Marshall, Dwight Eisenhower, or before uh, Harry Truman, clearly say, we have to prove the fr that the free market economy is good for all, not only for the rich. Well, 
And then, of course, as you know, in 1990 or so, communism collapsed under the conviction that free market economy was, was better. And we found out that in the languages of the world, the term globalization emerged after 1990. And what is it, did it mean? It meant the demise of the state, the weakening of the state, uh, resulting in part, or mostly, by a competition for lower taxation in all countries. So that countries had no money any longer to finance justice, equity, social inclusion and all that. And now, our result in the Commission was, if we want to maintain the high credibility of the free market economy, we better make it inclusive again and give the money that is needed for that to the state because the free markets won't do it. Uh, Jean, I saw you nodding. Uh, uh, at several points during the question, so I'll let you start and then we'll see if there are others to chime in on that. Okay. Uh, on the social dialogue, um, let, let's be frank, it does not exist at European level. Uh, the Commission is not very interested. Uh, business Europe is a business lobby and unions are weak and divided and uh, uh, therefore there's, there's not really anything serious happening. So maybe it may change, but that's the situation uh, uh, now. Uh, listening to you, I was also thinking, you know, countries are extremely different in this respect. And uh, even in countries where there is social dialogue, you can have very different roles. In Germany, you have a very defined responsibility for social dialogue. You have certain areas in which the government does not intervene. In my country, in France, uh, you have a confusion, an overlap of the role of the state and the role of social dialogue. Uh, so it's, it's hard to, to move that to, to European level, although there, is, there, 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 there were institutions put in place at the time of Jacques Delors, and, uh, but they haven't been uh, used for, for quite some time. Je voulais vous répondre aussi sur les nouveaux risques. Je suis tout à fait d'accord. Nous avons laisser, euh, nous avons construit un système qui était à base professionnelle et on a essayé de boucher les trous ensuite et de, de traiter des risques qui étaient mal traités par l'approche professionnelle. Mais on les traite mal aujourd'hui. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a à la fois il y a des populations ou des parcours individuels qui sont mal traités par ces risques, euh, qui ne sont pas couverts ou bien simplement les gens n'accèdent pas aux droits auxquels ils ont, ils ont droit. En France, il y a 8 milliards de droits qui, en principe, devraient se traduire par des prestations, qui ne se traduisent pas par des prestations parce que ceux qui lui ont droit ne le demandent pas. Donc, on a, on a absolument euh, le problème que, que, que vous dites. Euh, et, euh, et on a une conception de notre système qui est une conception trop rigide, trop héritée d'un moment où euh, tout se construisait sur une base professionnelle et on était dans une économie de plein emploi avec une difficulté à, à, à atteindre les objectifs. Je pense que c'est un des grands enjeux des, des politiques sociales, à, sachant que les politiques qui sont spécifiquement pour les pauvres sont aussi des politiques qui ne sont pas nécessairement efficaces, parce qu'il y a un effet de stigmatisation qui fait que les pauvres s'en détournent ou que ça a des effets négatifs, et en plus sont mal acceptés par une classe moyenne qui euh, aime bien l'État-providence lorsqu'elle est le premier bénéficiaire de l'État-providence. Donc, euh, donc Problem très, très lourd pour tous. Eve, uh, you had some comments. I was struck by the analysis of Mr. von Weizsäcker that the uh, welfare system was a child of the Cold War. Um, the title of this session is Whither the Welfare System, the European Model. We used to have the question often of whither NATO. Um, does the European, does, does the social welfare system have a future without the Cold War? To, to end the line and answer to the, to the questions, uh, also the question from the Algerian colleague, that uh, we're discussing now the social European social welfare state here this morning in, in Monaco because of the, uh, of the crisis. 
But I think we have to be aware of the fact that uh, Mr. von Weizsäcker made reference to the period when the system was built up and started, that <coughs> even in times of quite important economic growth, even in times and countries where there is uh, substantive economic growth, our social security system since uh, 25 to 30 years doesn't produce equality like it was meant to redistribute and produce equality, equality in income or even equality in chances. We issued not so long ago uh, uh, a report, Divided We Stand, about uh, equality and, and the development of, uh, in terms of income uh, and in terms of the distribution of GDP uh, per capita. And there you can see that even in terms of very important economic growth, economic success, progress, and even in countries which have a uh, egalitarian tradition like Sweden, since 20, 25 years, in fact, there is a growing inequality. And I think there, uh, elements which have been put forward by the, uh, par the colleague Algerien are very important. Nous avons bâti un système de sécurité sociale, les, les trois, quatre piliers traditionnels, avec un financement, uh, uh, je dirais, uh, préconçu. Uh, but society has developed, has changed. And once again, I think we underestimate the element of the um, resilience, empowerment, um, asking people to take their own responsibility in terms of uh, upscaling their, their skills, uh, preparedness to go back to the labor market, have longer careers, and so on. Um, and so I think it's a question also of resilience, and we have to, even if there would in the next years be more economic growth and the, the problem of financing our social security system would be kind of resolved, so to say, even then we will have to look very carefully and very closely at the element of uh, equality uh, improving of the social security schemes, which uh, uh, once again during the last 20, 25 years uh, was in fact decreasing. Uh, I have to say we have quite a dynamic panel here where you can actually see people wrestling with the questions they're being asked. I commend you for that. Joaquin, you had a remark? Yes, a, a couple of uh, quick remarks. First of all, regarding the social dialogue at the European level. I remember during the uh, 80s, 90s, uh, during the Delors period, there was a process of uh, social di dialogue at the European level, at the moment when not only the attitude regarding European integration was more positive than, than now, but also at the moment when the EU institutions were able to adopt some kind of uh, rules at the EU level on the social issues. This moment uh, disappeared during the past uh, decade and uh, given that now it's practically impossible that the European Council and the Parliament will agree on common rules following the legislative uh, decision-making process, the social partners at the EU level don't find uh, useful, interesting, don't find uh, that this is a priority to really discuss uh, new issues, apart the different positions and the different priorities of Business Europe on the one hand, and uh, the uh, European Confederation of uh, Trade Unions on the other. It's, uh, I think it's very unfortunate because, and I link with the second part of what I wanted to comment on the two other interventions, the welfare state or our social models requires a lot of changes because the society has changed completely. Mm -hmm. The uh, exclusion, one, uh, 25%, of the EU population is at uh, exclusion, of, uh, at the risk of exclusion, according to figures that were released a few days ago by Eurostat. This means that our social uh, policies, our social budgets, our social policy instruments are not at all efficient. If you look at the percentage of social expenditure in the GDP of Europe, 29%, is higher than the one existed before the crisis, also released recently by Eurostat. But inequalities have grown, and exclusion is at very high levels. Even poverty uh, levels in some of our member states are extremely high. So very different within Europe, but very, very high. So the welfare state, our social models, regardless of the differences between different countries, are not 
as efficient as they were in the, in the past, and this required changes. This required new instruments, new approaches, new uh, policy instruments to avoid exclusion, to avoid uh, the lack of social mobility for one part of our population, to avoid these uh, awful uh, uh, life conditions and working conditions in most of our industrialized areas or big uh, urban uh, uh, agglomerations uh, and all this. And this is not being discussed because during the, the last uh, 15, 20 years until the crisis, we were in a different approach. We were in an approach of light touch, no regulations, let the market go. And this was the consequence of what happened at the end of the, the 80s with the end of the Cold War and with the end of the communist system at the other side of the world. But now the financial crisis has changed again the, the way we are analyzing uh, our societies, but the policy discussion has not yet emerged. We are dealing with how to repair the financial system, how to solve the urgent, awful consequences of the crisis, but this discussion of what we need not to repeat the past uh, mistakes and to have a sustainable, not only sustainable growth, sustainable society is not yet there. And I think uh, this is, uh, in my view, an urgent discussion if we want to protect our citizens and if we want to have good arguments to protect our democracies. Because it, at the end, it's uh, the democratic system that is at risk in the situation we are living now. Yeah. Can I get a microphone over here to the distinguished gentleman in the front row, Carl Kaiser? And while the mic is coming, I'll say I think one of the interesting aspects of this conversation has been the identification of the question is it possible now to have a job and still live in poverty? It's a question we're beginning to debate in the United States as well. Carl? I would like, I would like to ask the panel whether the time hasn't come to make a courageous and, in my opinion, needed effort to deal with a growing problem, namely the question of the pension system in Europe, where I see a danger that the whole European model can get into real trouble. We know when it was said, the uh, age grows, that's a good thing, but the working age should also rise, the pension age should rise, but that's not happening. It's happening in some countries. Other countries, politicians have great problems in resisting the pressure uh, to stay where we are. Now, the signals are going in the opposite direction of what should be done. It started in France with the measures by President Hollande. The Grand Coalition in Berlin, which uh, will probably vote it in today uh, with the referendum of the Social Democrats, is giving an another signal, taking back the reforms of Gerhard Schröder, um, lowering the age to 63. So my question is, isn't this a problem where we could do something at the European level to help the politicians to deal with the problem, otherwise the system becomes unfinanceable? And could you pass the mic back, Carl? Uh, Erwin Haitong, French MP in charge of the UMP platform. Uh, in France, we uh, pay a lot of money for our social system. And nonetheless, it's rather inefficient with what we call the French preference towards unemployment. In, in that way, part of the discussion, the start of the discussion was more or less on paying more as I got, at the same time as some of us in France put the question of the new foundation of our social system. The uh, discussion does not go on the question of harmonization or uh, new European uh, directions on the social system, but the sheer analysis of what does not work. Uh, there are things which obviously do not work, particularly in our country. So the debate about spending more, maybe because uh, uh, there's been the crisis, is uh, not ours. Uh, the question of uh, more harmony in the social system in Europe may be one, but it does not erase the fact that the fundamentals of our system in France do not work. And uh, when we put the question as fundamentally as refoundation of the system, it looks very far 
from what you were talking about. Uh, for all those outsiders, we do not help. The discussion of spending more money uh, may be of interest, but if we keep on the lines we've been keeping for so long, there'll still be outsiders. And one more point. Uh, I know that when we speak about investment, some academics will say education is part of investment. When we speak about social system, academics may say education is part of the social system. I do acknowledge that a lot of money has to be uh, spent on education and that it's sound and reasonable. But I do not believe that extending all difficult issues to education does really help solve uh, neither the education issue nor the social issue. Unless I see uh, a hand with a burning question that we need to add. Is it burning, sir? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and this will wrap it up. <laughs> and if you could be succinct, you'd earn my thanks and the thanks of everybody who wants to get to lunch. The issues y'all have been talking about are not unusual in the United States. Washington State has a Boeing facility that might move to South Carolina. Our pension funds are at varying levels of insolvency in most of our states. Our welfare programs attract or repel people around the country. All of them sound like they're problems y'all have mentioned in the European situation. But in the United States, I think we have found that the competition among the states on the type of rules they envision has created some degree of experimentation. Indiana has moved to solve their, or at least alleviate their pension fund problems. Illinois has decided to go bankrupt, as far as I can see. <laughs> to what extent are you underrating the value of having individual nation states experiment with solving these various problems rather than trying to elevate it to the European situation? Didier, maybe you can wrap us up and yes, talk about Maybe three short remarks. First, uh, about pensions in general terms, but maybe more for the social issues, so don't have a misunderstanding. I fully agree that we need to go further with a social dialogue to have some minimum rules at the upper level, I said, also for the pensions. Due to what? Because we need to go further with the single market. We need to do more with open trade with other parts of the world. But to have the support of the population, we need to organize some minimum rules at the upper level because except that, we will have more and more protectionist approaches. So it's not a contradiction. We need some rules on social issues to be able to have a real single market. We are not so far in energy, in other fields. We need to do more. And also to have a real open trade with other parts of the world. The second element for pensions, we need to take the financing of the pension on board in the analysis of the sustainability of the public finances. For the moment, we are looking to the deficit, to the debt ratio, but we need to do more, it's beginning, about the quality of the public finances. And the quality of the public finances is also to see what kind of financing for the pensions. And of course, everywhere in Europe, we have the same discussions. Huh? How long is it needed to work? Um, 65 was a good idea, maybe in the Second World War, because it was the life expectancy. So we didn't need to pay the pensions. The people had a good idea to die just at 65. But if you have now an expectancy for more than 80s, you need to find a way to have another world. And so what kind of contributions were you on life? So there are a lot of discussions, but with maybe also some minimum rules at the upper level. And the third remark, je vais juste simplement revenir sur la, la, la question de notre collègue algérien, parce que je comprends et je ne vais pas répéter ce qui a été dit sur le caractère inclusif pour ceux qui aujourd'hui n'ont même pas accès aux droits minimaux parce qu'ils ne les demandent pas. Mais Derrière la démarche européenne, on parle beaucoup euh, dans toutes nos stratégies d'innovation. Pour une partie de la population, ce sera évidemment la solution. Mais il y a une partie de la population qui n'aura pas le niveau de qualification pour entrer dans ces métiers d'innovation et ces nouveaux métiers. Et donc je crois vraiment, et Jean le disait, l'éducation, mais notamment la formation professionnelle, est un élément majeur dans toutes nos sociétés si on veut qu'une partie de la population, et notamment des jeunes, et accès au marché du travail, pas dans les nouvelles technologies, mais dans des métiers, notamment manuels, pour lesquels, pour l'instant, certains pays, it's maybe the case in Germany, there are a lot of uh, good activities, you know, have a good relation among the enterprises and the, uh, the education system, but in my country, in Belgium, we are not doing enough about that. We need to go further to have a real qualification for part of the population without any access to the high-tech uh, new jobs. So that's, that's it. But again, 
some minimum rules in different social issues and also in pensions, it's quite important at the open level. Maybe some guidelines, some references, if we want to attract the population to support the open process. Except that we will have more and more protectionist approaches. So it's lunchtime. Je vous remercie, uh, monsieur, pour uh, une discussion très aimable, très, très, très percutante. <laughs> Nous allons maintenant procéder à un uh, déjeuner débat et uh, on reprend ici à 15 heures. Uh, et là, on verra. <laughs> <laughs>